Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day. And check out our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. Check out our altar sleeves, support the show by using the code Magic Mike's to check out for 5% off anything in that store. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, MTG Nerd Girl. Hey, guys, welcome back. Ruben Bressler. Good afternoon. How's it going? It's a uh, it's a lovely, wonderful Monday evening here in uh, here in Knoxville. Check off your bingo Fantastic. card. There you go. <laughs> we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call honorable mention, where Ruben will tell us who is the most eloquent, in letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top ten showcase cards. Ruben. Yeah, I really appreciated the thought that went into a lot of the comments that I saw on the YouTube this week. Um, but I, I sort of was struck by Matt Rucker's comment um, because it was a little surprising that we actually didn't have any of the Ikoria uh, Godzillas mm -hmm. on our list. Um, I'm disappointed, he writes, that none of the Toho monsters showed up from Ikoria. They're the first loved Universes Beyond edition, in editions and settled the how do we do question between wizards and fans in the Godzilla treatments. Out of all the excellent arts, I will tender Void Beckoner as my mention, and as it was treated unprecedentedly by Watsi during the troubles of 2020, they moved quickly and decisively to change the apt but very problematic name to Space Godzilla Void Invader, making it truly unique among Magic Cards, let alone showcase treatments. There you go. Well, uh, Void Beckoner, which was originally uh, Space Godzilla Death Corona and is now Space Godzilla Void Invader, was two black, six generic mana for an 8 8 uncommon nightmare horror with death touch with cycling of a black and two generic mana. And when you cycle Void Beckoner, put a death touch counter on target creature you control, which again was all cool, but you got to recognize this came out when was I Cordy released? Like March 2020. It was March. literally the same, Goodness. like within two weeks of when the COVID pandemic started, which of course is a novel coronavirus. And so death corona, not exactly the best time uh, for that particular Godzilla treatment. I feel like Wizards has fallen into this sort of poor timing. Cause like this set and that card was named a year plus before the oh, final yeah. thing was released. Oh, but yeah. like just, <laughs> there was the time where trapped in a tower was spoiled on 9-11. Right. Like stuff like that, where it's just like very clearly accidental, but also very like, ooh. Unforced errors. Too much yeah. on the nose. And you're like, ooh. They catch most of them. Like, they do. You can't, there's 20,000 magic cards. There's a uh, hundred, you know, pop culture references. And uh, at any given time, any number of taboo topics that, you have to, you know, sort of make sure that you don't talk about. They catch, I'm sure they catch the big ones. Um, the killing glare issue uh, being first among them in my mind. It's true. But yes, sometimes, and this one couldn't be avoided. This one was, you know, sent to print and came out already by the time uh, the COVID pandemic had started. So. And that's like the, the Corona term is actually used in the Godzilla, like, oh, yeah. Correct. It has to do with Corona the, is the term for the bright the light uh, halo that is around the sun. Right. And uh, other things have a Corona effect. In fact, coronaviruses have that effect. And so, you know, it's it's just it, it's self-referential. But to explain that would take way too long in being a magic card reference. Right. So yeah. what you have is that the first printing uh, was the, of course, the, the death Corona. And the second one uh, is now available for about, I don't know, 10% of what the other one costs, costs a couple bucks for the death Corona <laughs> yeah. one. If you really want it or whatever, I'll be honest at the time, you know, I think at the time, I think everything was going so crazy. They just decided to do that because it felt like it was something they could actively do and change. Does this make sense? You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. Yeah. Because in, in March 2020, we didn't know what the hell was going on. Everyone was flipping out. Everybody started working from home. Nobody could go anywhere. It was absolute silence in the streets of the cities across America, if not the world. And so I think Wizards was just like, we don't want to be associated with it. And we can do this Listen, change. So let's go. Had they not done this, the city of Corona, California, and the Corona beer and all of these other references would have, you know, had really cool altars of this card. Mm. 
Mm. It just so happens that it was the pat- taboo word of the of the moment as well. Well, thank you, Matt Rooker, for being a part of the show. Congratulations. Please contact us on social media. Twitter DMs at Magic Mike's Cast is preferred. Thanks again to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring this giveaway. Stay tuned for our top 10 list this week. And maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate because it's time to talk about Zendikar. This is a hell of a set. This came out in the fall of 2009, October 2009, to be specific. Uh, This is the sort of last set that I got to experience and or go through as someone who was not a part of the magic industry. Like I had made videos and I had won a contest and all that good stuff, but I wasn't like, I didn't work for a you know, an outlet or a site or a dealer or whatever. Um, I got hired, uh, I think it was the next January for Star City Games at that point. So uh, so this holds a special place in my heart as it was, you know, like there, there wasn't any sort of business lens with Zendikar. It was just, this is awesome and I love it and it's great. Very cool. Yeah. Nice. I, uh, I actually skipped this set. It was not mm. something I uh, experienced firsthand. So I um, don't weirdly enough know anything about the limited at, like environment because by the time i came around it was a little too pricey to like go back and and draft because there's a lot of good cards in this but thankfully there were plenty of cards that again are good and have uh you know impacted eternal formats so there's lots to talk about the limited format is the fastest limited format that has ever existed um if a card costs six it's unplayable and limited um this is i don't love this format but it was interesting to see one drops be good in a limited format yeah i you know to give you an idea the threaten effect of this set was still three mana still a red and two generic mana but it also put a plus one plus one counter on the creature you stole so like you stole their best thing and you made it bigger and then you smashed their face with it for three well, mana. And every like, one drop attacked for two, if not four. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything and, had kickers yeah. and it was just sick and awesome. And landfall stuff was fantastic as always. Um, all right. That said, let's go ahead and get started with our top 10. Ruben, what's your number 10? It's crazy what happens when you take an effect that's been around since literally the beginning of the game, mm-hmm. but then you add... Oh, by the way, you also draw a card to it. Because Seize Claim wasn't good. Lingering Mirage didn't see a ton of play, but Spreading Seas sure did. Oof. Um, and it revamped not only the standard format, but it made Merfolk go in a completely different direction in the older formats. Mm. Spreading Seas is a generic into blue, common enchantment aura that has not been reprinted since Zendikar. They're over a dollar a piece now. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and Enchanted Land is an island. Um, This card was particularly uh, damning against the popular Junge decks of the time. If you put this on a, on a, uh, a Jungle Shrine or a Savage Lands, you had a pretty good time. This card is $80 in foil. $80. Wow. God. Yeah, this is around the time where I feel like foils that are this age or older really start to shoot up just because like the amount of product that was being open at the time is not comparable to like the amount of product that is open today. So the foils just aren't that common. So yeah, it's pretty crazy how expensive some of these get. Yeah, it get, it gets absolutely wild. And so like 2009, 2010 was sort of the my golden years in terms of like working with wizards and doing coverage and flying around the world and whatever. And so in Rome in 2009 at the World Championships, like Jerry Thompson was there and like I remember it like just went through the hall and I was like, do you see what Jerry T's running? Oh my God, he's here, blah, blah, blah. Like, what, what are you talking about? I was like, no, no, he's playing over there. And everyone's just like looking where he, get, where he is. And next thing you know, like there's BDM like interviewing him over here about spreading seas and how it works and why it's awesome. And he just completely crushed that weekend with his spreading yeah. seas decks. It was awesome. And these days it's played in just like generic blue white control mm-hmm. because it's an effect that can disrupt opposing uh, you know, Celestial Colonnades or Raging Ravines or even a Valakut if you, you know, are able to pick it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it replaces itself. It's, it is a two mana, draw a card, and oh, by the way, disrupt your opponent. Yeah, and it's the cantrip that just puts it over the top. And, yeah. you know, as, as I recall from the time, like R&D was like, we thought it would be okay, but they, it turned out way better than they expected to. So, Nerd Girl, what's number 10? 
My number 10 is my first of three hires. Ooh, I got hires, but they're coming a little bit later. Uh, my number 10 is just a just a silly, like, j- just a silly card. This is one of those cards that, like, Zendikar is famous for having. Uh, I think it is awesome in its sort of flavor. It was also one of the first times I really felt that, and I know it's, it's a little thing, but it's a, one of the first times where I really felt Wizards was starting to just try to do... Some, kind of weird stuff, maybe some more flavorful stuff than they had done previously. But with Obsidian Fireheart, which was a mythic, it's not great, it's a dollar mythic. But for three red and generic mana, it's a 4-4 mythic elemental. With two red and generic mana, you put a blaze counter on target land without a blaze counter on it. For as long as that land has one, it has, quote, at the beginning of your upkeep, this land deals one damage to you. Okay, cool, but here's why it's awesome. In parentheses, in italics, the land continues to burn after Obsidian Fireheart has left the battlefield. Keeps burning. I love that that's rules reminder text. That's my favorite. I, I just love it's it. It's very good. I just I had to mention it. I could not have this thing on the list because it's so cool and unique. And one of the things I really remember about Zendikar was like, the land continues to burn. <laughs> that is a, a neat text. We see weird things like the town raiser tyrant on Arena that mm-hmm. like, do something sort of similar with like a Mm -hmm. flavor, a full effect of like the land burning. Right. And it's neat. Uh, It's definitely a really cool mechanic. The, the land continues to burn is the best parenthetical remind uh, rules, reminder text on a magic, on a printed magic card. Mm -hmm. Um, Just famous for, for that. I'm glad you had it at number 10. I'm sure that this would have been the honorable mention had it not been on anybody's (laughs) lists. Gotta snag it. All right, cool. Let's move on here to number nine. Nerd Girl, what's number nine? My number nine is kind of an honorary slot. This card is just like, you know, the bane of my existence. So I had to uh, I had to put it here at number nine because it stopped me from going 9-0 in a, in a Grand Prix. Um, I lost my, my last round to go to, to eight and one due to this card, not because I couldn't beat it, but because of what it looks like. So we're going to talk about Felidar Sovereign, oh, a boy. six mana, four colorless, white, white cat beast with uh, vigilance and life link at the beginning of your upkeep. If you have 40 or more life, you win the game. It's a four, six. Uh, my my sad story is that this looks like it can fly. So I uh, chose to not, uh, you know, attack into it. Uh, because I assumed they'd be able to fly over me with Vigilance and and, uh, and hit me on the way back. And so I wouldn't be able to outpace that anyway. But I could have just like multi-blocked it and uh, in, in instantly won the match for my 9-0. So I decided that this deserved a spot on my, uh, my number nine because this thing haunts me in my dreams. It's very thematic. I like, I like that. I mean, I yeah. don't like that it haunts you in your dreams, but I like how thematic. It looks like it I flies. Mean, like I, it's like it's on perched. the top of like a, yeah, a peak. At very least, it looks like it should have reach. Yeah, it's fair. And yet it does not. Yeah. And it got gotcha. you. It's been reprinted a couple of times. It's a limited bomb and uh, and it's a pretty cool card, but it does make me sad. Yep. I, I do enjoy an alternate win condition, sort of however I can get them, um, but I'm sorry the dagger is attached. <laughs> well, uh, what's cool about Zendikar, of all of the cards in the set... Of all of the options that we had, Ruben and I happened to choose the exact same number nine, which is kind of wild, but okay. Uh, This is a hell of a card. It's a fantastic card. This is one of the last things I added to my list because I felt like it was really a template for like how impactful giant creatures could be, how Wizards was trying to make really cool, interesting angels. This was before Avacyn came, for example, um, and Wizards really pushing like, how far can the mana costs go? And this was really, you know, the infancy of Commander was still around here. So it was really just a question of how can I cheat this thing into play? Not so much how could I make this my Commander or how would it fit in my Angel Commander deck? Uh, Ruben, tell us what our number nine is. Well, our number nine is Iona, the Shield of Emeria, mm. uh, which has six generic white, white, white. That's nine mana for its uh, casting cost. It is a 7-7 seven, seven flying legendary creature angel. As Iona enters the battlefield, you choose a color. Your opponents can't cast spells of the chosen color. <clears throat> um, this is a go-to reanimator target, particularly in the sort of Esper Gifts 
pile reanimator decks. Um, it's uh, banned in commander at this point because honestly, it's like kind of a, a beating. It's unfun in some ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a spectacular reanimator target. Yeah. Anything that says your opponents can no longer play the game makes me very, very sad. Uh, I, I'm glad that it's banned in Commander because I don't know because then you could like target one person's color or whatever and then just lock them out of the game feels pretty terrible especially because you can name the color that has all the removal right yeah I mean these days um, Modern Horizons 2 gave a Sarah Emissary which gives a protection to both Sarah Emissary and yourself which people often choose creatures which is yeah. its own problems and issues but this was the OG this was the first one where you're like man I can't I can't do nothing when you respond when you put this girl into play. It's like in Legacy, we'll choose blue. Thanks. Or we'll choose black and now you can't get rid of it. Or choose white and you can't source it. Like there's a whole variety of why you would choose a certain color. Um, and as I recall saying that, I would always choose the wrong coloring cube. I'd be like, Yeah, oh. of course. Like they got there's blue black deck, I'll choose uh I'll choose black and they'll have like a treachery. And I'm like, oh my god, you know, mm -hmm. happens every time. Let's move on here to number eight. Nerd girl, what you got? I do indeed have a number eight. This is not the most popular one, but I feel like it's a very beloved creature, not creature type, but specifically this insect, not all insects, but scoot mob. Everybody loves a scoot mob and a scoot swarm. And everybody just likes to say scoot. They're so, so, they're so cute. They scoot. They are adorable. And they're also, um, you know, really scary sometimes. This simple one, one for one insect at the beginning of your upkeep if you control five or more lands, put four counters on it. Holy smokes, it just becomes a five, five, yeah. nine, nine, and just like then you're dead. So um, if you can't answer this early, you're probably not going to. Uh, the flavor text is survival rule 781. There's always more scoot bugs. And I think we all like scoots. Scoot, mm -hmm. scoot, scoot. I, I love it. This is a land matters theme card that really works. It's it's cool. It's good early. It's good late. Uh, it's a good threat, even as a one mana one one, which I think is really hard to design. Uh, and you know your opponent has to answer it immediately. You might get you know two turns once it becomes a five five or whatever, but that's pretty much it. Then it just takes over the game and becomes an abyss. So, we want you to Ruben's number eight. What you got? Uh, my number eight is a card that I feel like is representative of a very specific era of Magic, as this card was in basically every format for like a year and a half, and then has completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, made lot several Pro Tours, if my mind is not deceiving me, uh, made its way all the way back to Legacy. Um, because it was a good target and enabler for the Lion's Eye Diamond dredge decks at the time. Uh, my number eight is Sphinx of Lost Truths. Ooh. Sphinx of Lost Truths is a five mana, three, five, three generic blue, blue Sphinx that has kicker of a generic and a blue. So seven mana or five mana. Uh, it is a three, five flyer. When it enters the battlefield, draw three cards. Then if it wasn't kicked, discard three cards. Um, this was an excellent top end of next level Bant decks, as well as an excellent uh, draw three, discard three to continue comboing off in Dredge uh, or open the vaults decks at the time um, mm. and found its way into a whole myriad of decks and then sort of just disappeared at a certain point. Better I options like were available. I like all the Sphinx stuff. Like I, they, they all yeah. tend to be very good when they're like in standard and a lot of them kind of phase out and don't uh, impact you know, long-term eternal formats, but they're all very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is around the time when Wizards really started making Sphinxes and Sphinxes in blue and saying blue is the Sphinx color. This is like one of their main creature types. And so they started putting a bunch of them. And here we have literally two rare ones in the set. Um, and this, yeah, this card was neat and cool. And then like faithless looting showed up or whatever and you're like i don't have to work sure. as hard anymore to draw three or draw x and discard y so yeah but it was fun while it lasted all right let's move on here to my number eight this card is silly this card is also the most expensive card in the set that's not a land 
Uh, this card is like silly. This card is, I definitely wanted to include uh, a trap card. The fact that there was no traps in the other Zendikar sets makes me sad, and there should be traps. I love traps. You should make more traps. Uh, this is the only mythic trap, and they haven't reprinted the damn thing, so it's $25 which is ridiculous, and it'll show up in a master set at some point because Mind Break Trap is just like what you need in your life when you play against a Storm deck. It's just almost like required because, again, the way that it works, you don't necessarily need to play blue at all to play a Mind Break Trap because it's too blue, too generic mana for a Mythic Instant Trap. However, if an opponent casts three or more spells this turn, you may pay zero rather than pay Mind Break Trap's mana cost, and you exile any number of target spells. This is yeah. uh, like the only time in Magic you'll ever, ever ever get to say that you like found my trap card. Yep, you, you activated my trap card. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I've missed traps. I, love I, traps. I I want more traps. I don't know why we don't have them. I don't either. I don't. Like when we came, when we went back to Zendikar. Right, when we went back again the second time. The How did we not time. have it? Well, the first time when we went back to Zendikar, we're going to get, we're going to get our Indiana Jones set. More traps. Hooray. And then that didn't happen at all. But then the second time we went back to Zendikar, we were like, finally, they're going to do Indiana Jones set. And they did. And we still didn't get traps. And I love the concept. I activated my trap card is part of the zeitgeist of the world, especially of card games. Yes. And and on top of all of that, this card has been an a irreplaceable, indelible, one of a kind part of vintage ever since it was printed. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm wondering if it has a little something to do with like it being difficult to track how many spells and people having to keep track of that when things are storming and or whatever. Also, I'm wondering if like there is a great way to program that like into Moto and stuff could be like a consideration. It might just be a more difficult card to manage for like online stuff. But I agree that like the idea behind a trap card and the amount of things that have happened in the game or haven't happened in the game determining the mana cost. But now we're starting to get into the digital format, right? Where it's like a little tricky. Yeah, and, and for what it's worth, I think those are that's definitely valid. Um, I think ultimately, you know, and there were a lot of really sort of simple ones. If an opponent had an artifact into the battlefield, you get to play a thing. Or if four or more creatures are attacking, you know, you got to do a thing. Um, you know, yeah. I, I love that. I think that sort of push and pull gameplay is really fun uh, and gives the, there's sort of, it provides sort of a tension, you know, that's yeah. just not there. Because like Whiplash Trap or whatever, that thing you bounce two creatures for one mana or you spent five mana on it, that's a huge swing. And I love all that the stuff. Traps, like knowing what all the traps did in Limited was hugely important. Yes. The Bailoff Cage Trap, yes. the Razor Spike Trap were five mana spells that cost two if a certain thing happened. Right. So they were hugely relevant, uh, especially in Limited. Yeah. So, you know, uh, summoning trap was, was monstrous. All sorts of cool, fun gameplay in that. I super loved it. Uh, all right, let's move on here to number seven. Uh, mine is higher on somebody else's list, but that's okay because it's awesome. Nerd Girl, what's number seven? I do have a number seven. This is my last one before two hires. Eek. So this is a, an interesting card that kind of built some decks. And the first time I played against it was like, wait, what does this have to do? I had to read it a couple of times and it will kill you out of nowhere. And it's still a $20 uh, rare, only a rare. And uh, it's, you know, still, still pretty big. It's actually a lot more than that. This is moderately played for like $20. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be the Valakut, the Molten Pinnacle. It's this true. land can, can definitely kill some people out of nowhere. This uh, is a land that produces a red mana. Enters the battlefield tapped whenever a mountain enters the battlefield under your control. If you control at least five other mountains, you may have uh, Valakut deal three damage to any target uh, creature or player. And with all of the, like, um, you know, search lands, ramps and things, like, holy smokes, this just starts to combo off and do some crazy stuff. Yeah, Prime, Primeval Titan showed up. When this was about, you know, what, eight months old, nine months old or so, uh, and just changed literally everything. And M11 uh, and their giant titans, you know, said, hey, just go find all these lands. And, this, and the fact that the land is not legendary, but it's written as though it were legendary. And Wizards had this weird push and pull at the time of, we don't like legendary lands because they're, you know, restrictive in deck building. But these days, 
like it literally doesn't matter because most of deck building and magic is you know, commander. That's one of so who cares? Right. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of a kind of a weird little artifact from the era of how they uh, they treated legendary lands. Yeah, I love looking at Valakut deck lists <laughs> because they're all like, here are the non lands. Tell me how you think this deck wins. And it's like, well, it's all blue and green cards. So I assume it's all blue and green stuff. Like, we just attack you. I don't know what, what the answer is. And you go, wrong! It's 17 mountains! Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's just playing with Valakut, right? Like, it's all Bring to Light and Primeval Titan and Explorer and Summer Bloom and all these, you know, blue-green effects. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, every one of them is a Stomping Ground or a Steam Vents. Um, and then you go to town. Uh, yeah, this card definitely shifted and changed the way that multiple formats built mana bases and had to be mitigated for. Yeah, Morning Tide gave escape shift and escape shift plus Valakut was a thing, but you really needed that Primeval Titan to give it that extra nudge to make it just go absolutely bananas in standard, and it certainly did. So that was fun. Ruben, what's number seven? My number seven is a beloved, uh, very good, very soft boy uh that oh by the way will deal you a million damage and kill you on turn three a whole heck of a lot of the time uh had great success in kind of every format um but had its most success in the extended format surprisingly in a white weenie deck surprisingly in the hands of paul ritzel mm -hmm. not surprising um this of course uh is um step links yeah Steplinks is a one white mana, zero one cat with landfall. Whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, Steplinks gets plus two, plus two till the end of the turn. A very common play pattern in Limited at the time was turn one, Steplinks. Turn two, Terramorphic Expanse, play another Steplinks, attack you for four. Turn three, Harrow, let's say, or another way to play multiple lands in a turn. Um, and then you're dead. You're just dead. This alongside played a Geopede was like one of the main archetype, the landfall aggro archetype in limited. And oh, by the way, fetch lands and um, uh, Knight of the White Orchid, as well as Flagstones of Trocare were played alongside it in the Pro Tour Amsterdam Pro Tour deck with uh, that Paul Rietzel won that tournament with. Hmm. Yeah, this is definitely what you were talking about at the beginning of the of the show. And what I've heard uh, about the format in general is that these one drops were just insanely powerful. And this is definitely one of those. It doesn't surprise me that uh, it definitely made its way into Constructed. Yeah, and this is, you know, an official landfall card. Uh, one of the best mechanics literally ever made. Uh, I absolutely love it. I adore it. I like when, you know, like fast formats are unique and you look at like what, what really makes them tick and most of it was the stupid one and two drops were just unreal powerful and the three plus drops were not good enough at stopping the one drops and the two drops. And, you know, uh, it's, it's wild to me. I know it's sort of hard to sort of, describe in many ways but paul the way paul riesel would play magic this guy was so when yeah. you watch the really good ones do it 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 just feels effortless you know the best ones make it look easy and like paul he just every decision the guy made was the right one and it was just a joy to watch him pilot this kind of deck and uh yeah. it was awesome so there's something to be said for people who could play any type of deck Mm -hmm. But there's something also to be said for people who have a specialty, right? right? And when you see a step links in the hands of Paul Ritzel, it's like seeing a, a rune snag in the hands of Guillaume Wafotapa. It's like seeing yeah. a Llanowar Elves in the hands of Zvi Mauschewitz. It's like seeing, you know, um, uh, let's say uh, a primeval Titan in the hands of Brian Kibler, or even something just like a four, 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 four sure. in the hands of, you know, someone who's like Brian Kibler. And there's, there's really interesting interplay because the talk leading up to this pro tour was can't play mono white. Uh, it's bad. Right. So much so that Craig Wesco didn't play mono white at this tournament. And then Paul Rietzel <laughs> plays mono white as like the only person, I think who might've been playing something what are the like only this ones? and then wins the tournament. Yeah. Hmm. 
yeah, absolute freaking master. And it was great. I was there for that one in Amsterdam. It was super duper fun. Um, and it, again, it was just incredible to watch. I know um, we've gone so far from like the Pro Tour and lauding these magical 400 players that play at this event. But man, when it was when it was rocking, it was really awesome and really special. Um, let's move on here to number six. Now, Nerd Girl, you are out for the next couple, unfortunately. So Ruben. Yeah, Ruben, what's number six? Uh, I don't. This one is actually uh, the only hire, I believe, I have on my list. Oh, boy. Fun, wow. fun, fun. Well, uh, my number six is uh, a hell of a magic card. Now, there is a more expensive version of this cycle. You know, there there is, and you could even argue it's even more popular and more expensive as a result. But what I found interesting was that of all of the one, out of all the cards in this cycle, they chose this one for Masters 25 to help represent Zendikar in the set. And that was Luminarch Ascension. And this is also a great card and sort of an example of an entire cycle of cards that were just not good in constructed and at any point in time and people try to make them work but when you jump into commander these things yeah. are insane luminarch ascension is a white and a generic mana for a rare enchantment that says at the beginning of each opponent's end step that's every single one if you do if you did not lose life this turn you may put a quest counter on luminarch ascension for a white and a generic mana, you create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying, and you activate it only if Luminarch Ascension has four or more quest counters on it, which is usually a couple turns in Commander. Suddenly you're making two mana 4-4 flying angels. Let's go. Yeah. Couple couple turns in commander. It's you know it takes a lot longer in in you know constructed gameplay one on one, but in a commander game, why not? Uh also, I wonder how this would trigger in a uh, 2HG game, do you get two triggers? That's a good question. I think you do, because it's each opponent, and you, it does count each opponent when yeah. like you have those effects and stuff. So that's kind of cute as well. You really, you know, you play this, and if you happen to have a decent board to to, to stay stable, then you're starting to pump out some big creatures. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it's easier to see why this card sees playing Commander and not in Constructed, like Standard or Legacy, than it is to see why kids love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. This is the poster child for a commander card, because not only are there four times as many end steps, there's also way less attacking, particularly starting on turn two. Mm. If you can drop this on turn two, you're done. Like, the the you don't need to do anything else. Yeah, and there's this is like during a time where commander cards cards were not created for commander right so you know these types of abilities that would you know commander players could really take advantage of kind of like birthed the format i think and it's really interesting to see because we see this kind of stuff all the time now where cool. i'm reading like half the set and i'm like oh this is not for me um but now these these little ones these little nuggets i really really enjoy seeing how uh how they were used to create a format yeah, I mean, and there was definitely people who tried to make blue-white control with Luminarch Ascension work. You know, can I run enough rats? Yeah. Can I run or enough fogs? Fog. Right, can yeah. I run enough fogs and rats to make it work? But never consistent enough to be anywhere near a tier. Um, but it was fun. All right, let's move on here to number five. This is Nerd Girl's last hire. Ruben, what's number five? Uh, I'm shocked that this, that, uh, this one's not higher on somebody else's list. I can't, I honestly am... I put this at my number five thinking it would be somebody's two or three. Um, but here we are talking about Lotus Cobra at number five. It's true. Uh, Lotus Cobra is a generic and a green for a 2-1 snake uh, that was originally a mythic. Is it still a mythic? No. No, it's, it's a rare, a rare now. rare now. They bumped uh, it. Printed in Zendikar Rising and Iconic Masters, among many other promos. It has Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, add one mana of any color. Um, this was a paradigm shift in magic design. This was the first mythic rare that was priced to play in standard. Most of the mythics at that point were Baneslayer-esque. What I mean by that is, of course, Baneslayer Angel uh, saw play, but it, they were expensive. They were top-end finishers, and they were meant to be more splashy than they were meant to be competitive. Lotus Cobra is not, I mean, it's splashy, but it's competitive, right? This saw play in Vintage for a while uh, because you could get out very early things like Jace the Mind Sculptor um, and, of course, has seen play in Standard and Modern ever since that it was printed. 
Yep, we recently got a reprint. This was my number six. Nice. Um, this also got like some really, really beautiful uh, premiere art, which is one of my favorites. I think this card just is all around. When these types of cards and these de the decks that they're in are good, I think that that is a healthy format typically. Hmm. I mean, this was a card that was so ridiculous. Like, you know, they busted fetch lands fairly early to get everyone losing their minds. And like when I saw this like spoiler that showed up in MTG Salvation or whatever, you know, long before the official preview, everyone was calling it fake. Everyone was like, this, you're, you're lying. It's not, it cannot possibly be this good. It cannot possibly be a two, one and not a one, one. You know what I mean? It cannot possibly get you a mana for every single land that enters. The, are you kidding me? That means you can play a turn, you know, a five mana card on turn three, like yeah. Bane Slayer Angel. And that's yeah. exactly what happened. And this card was bananas. It was yeah. really bad with Omnath, like when the yes. two were side by side. But when, when once you got rid of Omnath, I felt like we still saw it a lot and mm -hmm. those decks didn't feel super oppressive. So like it kind of, to me, felt like the Lotus Cobra wasn't the problem. It's just like an enabler for like strong top end, which is usually not a problem unless you have an Omnath. Well, I mean, yeah, and this is what I'm, I'm certainly, certainly grateful it's on your list because I think we had talked about it uh, for Zendikar Rising. At least I believe I did at one point. Um, and again, I love the card. Absolutely ridiculous. And my favorite memory is that no one thought this was real. I, I, I want to say I had a conversation with Mike Flores at the time and I explained to him what it was. And he said, you're lying. He's like, that's <laughs> not that's not what that that is. And I'm like, dude, that's just what this says on the website. I know it sounds insane. And it was. Uh, all right. So for my number five, this is the card that you would play in response to Lotus Cobra. This is the card on my list that represents one of the best and most awesome. This literally could be argued as the best mechanic of all time. Most mechanics are literally just flavors of this one. And that would be kicker. So if they play the Lotus Cobra, you burst lightning that thing because later on you could kick it and it would just run the format for you. This gave you the benchmark for every creature that you played. Either you played it and it died a burst lightning early or you played it and it hopefully lived through a late burst lightning kicked for one red mana. It's a common instant with kicker of four generic mana, which means you may pay an additional four generic mana as you cast this spell. It deals two damage to target creature or player, but if it was kicked, it deals four damage to target creature or or player and these days that's any target so you can still hit a planeswalker and four to the face is a lot to the face yeah yep we have things like this now where the, like we have the shocks with something that boosts it right now i think mm -hmm. the current one in standard is like sacrifice an artifact but Baltic anytime surge. you have yep. these sorts of mechanics that just make your shocks a little bit better mm -hmm. uh, where you can draw them early or draw them late and get a bonus i like that where cards kind of scale I think it makes for good set design when you can like balance those. Yeah. This card was so good that they nerfed it for Dominaria in the form of Shivan Fire, where it could only target creatures. Mm -hmm. um, now, 90% of the time, you're killing a one drop or a two drop with it. And then most of the rest of the time, you're killing a, you know, a four, four flying haste dragon. But going to the face is not irrelevant. Like you can, and at the time, the only way to go to the to planeswalkers really was to go to the face, right? Yeah, you had to you redirect. Just target planeswalkers. No, you had to redirect for a very, very long time. So there was, I mean, there was never a time when this wouldn't be able to hit planeswalkers, but right. um, it's certainly very good. And being able to, you know, late game just dome somebody for four after the the board gets stalled, it's pretty good. I mean. You know, g gather around children, let us tell you the tales of the original Planeswalkers when, and this lasted way too long, which is to deal damage, to real, use direct damage to them, you you targeted the player and you redirected the damage to the right. Planeswalker. And that was just yeah. really weird. That was weird. We have Royal time. Eruption now, which is like the same, same ability that's, that's currently in standard. Kicker adds damage, but it is like a slightly larger scale. It's like two mana for three and then five. So yeah. a very similar set design. Yeah, yeah, and it's great. It plays great, and it's awesome. Again, this being an instant was a thing. This thing going to the face was a thing, and just another contributor to how stupidly fast this format was. Uh, that's burst lighting. So let's move on here to number four, Nerd Girl. What's number four? I'm back. I have a You're number back. four. So uh, a card that I, a deck that I talk about very often that makes my top 10 list because it's one of my favorite decks and my, my pet thing that I always make. So you guys have had me talk about Gravecrawler and Vengevine, but I've never had a chance to talk about the third member of my party. 
and that's Bloodgast. Mm-hmm. We have black, black for a vampire spirit. It's a 2-1, says Bloodgast can't block. Uh, Bloodgast has haste as long as your opponent's life is 10 or uh, life or less. And then it has landfall. Whenever a land enters battlefield under your control, you may return Bloodgast from your graveyard to your battlefield. They, It's like a happy family. It's perfect. This deck and archetype brings me much joy. And I want to share that joy with all of you. This was my hire. Um, nice. And yeah, Bloodgast is spectacular. Uh, the rate you get is really good. Even if you're not comboing off with it, which a lot of the time you were doing weird dread shenanigans or Vengeance Vine shenanigans, you don't need to try to make Bloodgast good because all you have to do is play magic. It was a solid two drop in the vampire deck because it was just consist. Even if you killed it, even if you blocked it, it just came right back the very next uh, turn. Uh, And oh, by the way, in the vintage cube, this is the perfect thing to sacrifice to your like recurring nightmares or your like kick or sacrifice a creature abilities, um, discard a card. Like if you have a smokestack in this in play, that's a good time for me, not for you. Um, But yeah, it's a this card's amazing. Yeah, this card is super sweet. And it also, I recall it like flying under the radar a little bit. I think the fact that it couldn't block put a lot of people off. And then they finally were just like, I don't care if it can't block. I can just, there's all this other cool stuff. But it just keeps coming back. It will crush you. It wins long games. It has fantastic interactions. It's wonderful in cubes. And it's 11 plus dollars all day long, no matter where you're going to find it. Sure. Yeah. All right. Ruben, what's your number four? I, I, so I haven't, I don't think I've talked about, no, I haven't yet. This was a golden age Zendikar for goblins they were they printed some really good goblins in zendikar um and there's a couple that were on my short list that i'm not going to get to talk about uh but this one i'm going to talk about because it might be the best sideboard card ever like it's very let me rephrase the best sideboard card that doesn't hate on a color specifically um like it's right up there with rest in peace but the thing about this is that it was in so many different sideboards at the time. Because if you were playing in the standard format, everyone was playing three colors. Everyone was trying to do crazy things with their lands. So if you had something that could impact an opponent's mana base and also put pressure on them, then you were golden. It was so good that people started main decking. Goblin Ruin Blaster. Yeah. Goblin Rune Blaster is too generic into red for a 2-1 Goblin Shaman with haste, with kicker of a red mana. When Goblin Rune Blaster enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, destroy target non-basic land. This card was an absolute beating. <laughs> yeah, the people who hate, like, aggro decks and land destruction decks also oftentimes go hand in hand, so you get kind of get both of the bits here. Oh my god, this card was nuts. This card was insane. Like they don't, they literally don't make them like this anymore. Like they will not give you a huge multicolor heavy format and then provide you the way to just completely screw that up. The most they will go these days is the dragon that makes you pay two life or whatever or sack it. Yeah, sure. No, back in the day it died. You take that, that that cool triome and you put it in the trash where it belongs, and then I attack you for two on the end of it. Like good, clean. Like again, I I want cards like this because they literally don't make them like this any longer. Yeah, I mean, land destruction makes people not get to play magic. I know, but you know, when you grow up with land destruction, when you learn magic and land destruction is such an integral part of the game, all the way through to this era, like destroying people's lands and tectonic edge showing up in, in world wake, like things only continued in that regard to hate on basic lands and say, we're going to give you powerful man lands, but also want to give you ways to destroy them. And that's what they did. I agree. I your, had, your room, um, I had you're it. Muted. <clears throat> Go ahead. I was just gonna say I, I grew up with land destruction as well, but yeah, I can see why people don't like it. Yeah. Oh, I'm I mean, definitely. this is the perfect balance of land destruction, though, right? Like, yeah. stone rains too much, lay waste is bad, right? As has often been said, the correct number for destroy target land is two, is three and a half mana. Three and a half mana. That's the first Stapling one. Stapling a two one with haste onto it 
that also is two red mana in that four mana, so it's not as easily splashable, and right. only targets non-basic lands, I think is like, it's it's exactly where you want to be. I like that. I appreciated the fact that they they knew going in they were going to make really, really good lands, and they said, okay, we got to give them some so, some sort of stopgap, so you can't just go completely AWOL or a crap, rather, um, with, uh, with all your cool lands, but... Uh, speaking of lands that you would go completely ape over and lands that I absolutely love, lands that like just remind me of both Zendikar, like this was this was used in a lot of the marketing for the set uh, going forward. This is one of the first cards that was previewed, as I recall. This remains one of the, just the coolest magic cards. I just love the damn name of it. It's just so damn epic. When you talk about Amiria, the Sky Ruin. Amiria, the Sky Ruin. How cool is that name? It's amazing. And it's a rare land that enters the battlefield tap. But at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven or more planes, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. That's for freezies. That's, you didn't pay anything for that. You just to make sure you count some planes. You know, we're waiting on the Urborg that turns everything into planes. Most certainly. Doesn't matter. This thing still taps for a white mana and costs 15 plus dollars because it's awesome. And I love it. The end. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's a hell of a card. It's, it's epic. This is what a, to my mind, this is what a mythic looks like. This yeah. is the, where you're like, you need to get a huge number and then you get a huge effect. Right. My favorite thing about the cards that Evan gets very excited about is that like he get, he's so excited. I feel like he he's not breathing, and then he gets to the end. And he's like blend, and like that's it's like so fast. It's like a snowball that just like de dead stops mm -hmm. on a dime. It's it's right. adorable. I, I enjoy it so <laughs> I much. Love it. I love it. I love this card. It's so cool. It's so cool. nine is a lot though. This was very difficult to make work. Sure, Sometimes I mean the best cards that we love don't necessarily have to be the best. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we just gotta, love them. Yeah, sometimes you got to work for it. And sometimes mm -hmm. maybe it should have been five or whatever for constructed, but it's who okay cares? just love things. I just love things. I think this card's great. And it, it reminds me of like the cool, the wonder of Zendikar, how it was different. It was new. It made lands do different things and care about different ways that lands were on the battlefield. Uh, and this is a great example. All right, let's move on here to number three. Uh, the second of my hires, but that's okay because it's awesome. Nerd Girl, what's number three? I definitely have a number three. This is a card I have found recently that I didn't know how much I uh, wanted in my life. This is a staple in my commander deck and a card I've definitely won the most games with in, my, in that commander deck. Like when I find this card, it kind of makes the entire deck. And that's Eldrazi Monument. Mm -hmm. uh, five Ooh. mana artifact for uh, creatures you control get plus one plus one have flying and indestructible but at the beginning of your upkeep sacrifice a creature if you can't you sacrifice Eldrazi monument this is uh, an absolute blowout card and when you're um, running a Tesa and you have like bitter blossom and a bunch mm -hmm. of dudes that like tap to poop out dudes and then your Tesa can sack dudes that make more dudes. And uh, yeah, then this just turns into like an instant win. And I love it. I also had this out and I played like a Hopolite and just made a bajillion things. It's fantastic. Definitely recommend uh, the just token cutesy decks that don't get too crazy, but this is a card for it. It will blow your mind how this card was bad and limited. You're like, how? Yeah. How is it? And they're like, it's too slow. And you're like, no, it's not. Yeah. It's a five minute mythic that makes all my stuff fly and get huge. And just start, there's no way. And they're like, I'm sorry, it's too slow. Like, you'll just die to a burst lightning kick next turn. And you're like, no, I won't. How did this happen? Yeah. It's it's crazy. But in any it, other format, it would have been probably fine. It would have been unbelievable Incredible. in any other format. And in standard, <laughs> it was also fine. Like, it was, it was, it was not, you know, the end all be all, but certainly. You know, you'd want to play it as your turn five play in your aggro deck. So right. you'd play one or two in, you know, your vampires deck or your mono white or your mono red deck. And maybe you wouldn't even care about the drawback. You would just go, all right, here's plus one, plus one and flying for the rest of the turn. Let's go to town um, or play it into a, like a wrath filled deck. Um, it was just a solid card. 
Yeah, I mean, Day of Judgment was a gigantic printing from the set at the time. And, oh, my God, we got Wrath back. So, like, the fact that got Wrath back was huge. So there was a non-zero amount of people who liked to play it, and like, in response to the model white or the white-blue uh, control decks. Um, but, again, what what just, just destroyed my world it was I was, like, you know, jamming this thing in my draft deck. And they're like, "What, well, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, but, 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 but. They're like, you need to play this this two-drop and this three-drop instead. And I'm like, but, but, it's mythic. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, it's fine. Ruben, what's number three? My number three uh, is a card that I put at number three because usually it goes and gets the third piece of a puzzle. Mm. Um, it is a very important facet of today's pauper. Uh, it is a very important facet of, back in the day, finding an extra cloud post or in the hands uh, of Thorolf Severin, winning Mythic Championship 4 in Barcelona, finding the missing Tron piece of Urza's Tower, Urza's Power Plant, and Urza's Mine. Um, Because you can't naturally draw Tron all of the time. Some of the time, you actually have to use an expedition map. One generic mana gets you a common artifact, the cheapest of which you can find is going to be about two and a half dollars. Um... And it has the activated ability of pay two generic, tap and sacrifice it, search your library for a land card, reveal it, and put it into your hand. This is a very, very important piece of Pauper, as well as most regular Tron decks. Yeah, this was the last card I cut from my top ten list, and uh, the reason I decided to cut it is because I hate Tron. But, but hey, that's fair. But Tron <laughs> rules. I love Tron. It's silly and it's, it's absurd. And I like to watch Tron players suffer too. It's okay. Yeah. But this was my number seven. I think this card is nuts. This The fact that it's like two and a half bucks, it is what it is. I love, just love when they make cool extended art versions of commons. And they did this for Double Masters. It's extended art. They, they mark it as rare. It's super sweet. It's a 20 plus dollar version of this $2 card if you really need it. But if you want to get swanky, swanky exists and like find cards like this and do this all the time because i love it a hell of a magic card it's one of those cards that like you felt like it always existed you know what i mean you felt like like oh like this is it's always been around right just pay some mana on artifact get a land no no it started right here and mm-hmm. that was huge uh let's move on here to uh <laughs> to our number two this yes. is no no literally everyone's Number oh. two, not just <laughs> mine, Rubens, not just mine and nerd girls. Is this all... the first time this has happened? I Maybe. Think for us, I think it is the very first time we've Hilarious. all had the exact same number two. This is a card that helped define what Zendikar even really was. It, it helped yep. define how powerful creatures were going to be. Mike Turian left his mark on magic through this awesome freaking card. Uh, it continues to this day to be unreal. The fact you can play this on turn one and then play two more on turn two. Uh, I don't think I've ever lost a game where I've been able to pull that off. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, Nerd Girl, t- tell us about what our number two does. Our number two is uh, an amazing card. I was, I think Ruben's looking for it, but I literally- I'm have looking one. for it. He's I have it right next mine. to me. I have it in this deck box. Oh, okay. oh. I played it this weekend. Amazing. Uh, nice. As it turns out. So we, we, we all have very easy <laughs> access to this card because it's so good and so impactful. We're going to talk about Goblin Guide, Woo-hoo. a one mana Goblin Scout with haste. It's a two, two. This is when it attacks. Defending player reveals the top card of his or her library. If it's a land card, that player puts it into their hand. I think that's really important because a two mana haster for one plus a goblin, which is a relevant card type is, uh, is pretty good. So being able to give your opponent the chance to get a free card is, uh, is pretty substantial. And I will say if your opponent hits once or twice with a goblin guide, oftentimes that is the doom of your deck. But if you can get away from, you know, if you can get lucky and not hit that and get some free information on their card draws to boot, feels really, really powerful. So I feel like it's a really uh, great card that has a lot more to it than meets the eye. Yeah, agreed. I, I, um, I also uh, uh, paid my respects to Shiro today at the at or this weekend at the RCQ Trios event. So perfect. my Boros burn is uh, you know loving, lovingly displayed with the Shiros. Nice. 
Um, I got a really excellent uh, play set of signed Goblin Guides from our buddy MTG Packfoils at one point, and nice. they're somewhere back here, but I don't know exactly where they are. Um, God, I love a Goblin Guide. And it's it's like why a burn deck works. Like, I like burning my opponent. A Lava Spike is great, but, you know, you can still win if they have a Ley Line of Sanctity in play. You just draw a bunch of Goblin Guides. Um, it's a, and you can still win if they play a core firewalker and you attack with your goblin guide because you've got, you know, skull crack or stomp or whatever, uh, to be able to make all damage not be able to be prevented. Goblin guide is why, like, if there isn't a goblin guide, I don't think burn is a playable deck. Um, it's arguable that Monastery Swift Spear is better, but also Monastery Swift Spear wasn't always here. And Goblin Guide is is why you can play Burn in these older formats. Oh, yeah. yeah. This was a $20 card for years and years and years. $40 foils, $40 Grand Prix promos, all to live long day. These days, five-ish to eight-something dollars for the extended art version of Double Masters, which is cool. Oh. You can even get the Time Spiral, the old frame foil for about three bucks. That's incredible. Um, and yeah, Monastery Swiss Spear is... Just an unbelievable magic card. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think you want, you know, Goblin Guides to be kind of the what a one drop should be in terms of an exciting rare in red. And this was, you know, I, I just I think back to the conversations I had in Rome with Mike Turian and I was just like, Goblin Guide. He was just like, yeah, yeah but it's fun. Right. And I'm like, dude, you it's a one man at two two. Hey, he's like, yeah, but it's fun. Right. I'm like, bro, I. Yes, but it's okay. You know, it's just one of those conversations where I just could not wrap my head around. And he's like, but it's fun. And I'm like, it, it is fun. I do love me a goblin guide. All right. Let's turn here to our number one nerd girl. What's your number one? My number one is without a doubt, the best card. One of my favorite cards of all time. I don't know how it's not on your guys' list. I feel like it should have been all three of our number ones because it's that amazing and that cute. And that lovable. And I know you guys don't hate, don't like Mill, but here we are. Hedron Crab, number one. One <laughs> mana for an O2 creature crab with landfall. It says whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control, target player puts the top three cards of his or her library into her, her graveyard. Uh, this is, there's two printings of this and it's like $5 for an uncommon. That's how amazing this card is. And it's super cute and it pinches. Yeah. It's a very good, it's a very good card and it's a very cute card and it's a very, it tells a story with the flavor text. Um, it's, um, and it led to the printing of Ruin Crab. The reason why crabs are synonymous now, it's like little crabs are synonymous with mill is because of this card. Um, this card enabled uh, self mill strategies as well, making, you know, your blood gasps even better. So yeah, I, uh, Hedron Crab is very, very good. He, he, Hedron Crab is just, first of all, reprinted already, Wizards. What are you doing? What's going on in our lives here? You really couldn't have just thrown this in a Double Masters one or two? Um, but Hadron Crab by itself, uh, to me, the key to this card was that it milled three cards. Now, we were used to a world that milled two cards, milled two cards for that, two cards for this, tap to mill two cards, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. This went that extra step to give you one extra card, which could literally mill people out in limited at times because... I mean, that's just kind of how it went when you mill a lot. Um, but it's just incredible how much you could mill thanks to Hedron Crab that just pushed it that much further to make the mill players really happy. Like, I know it's a little thing, just one extra card, but still. No, Ruben. it's amazing. It's fun. Yeah. It's super cool. Annie Peach. Annie Peach. Annie Peach. Ruben, what's number one? I love the provenance, the, the story of cards and when i'm building my top 10 i keep my eye out for cards that are not only good in their time but also cards that are good going forward and one of my main barometers for both of these is did it win a pro tour title and is it in the pro tour or is it in the cube because if it won a pro tour title that means it was good in its time if it's in the cube that means that it stood the test of time um, it's also this card that's my number one is also very popular in commander. Um, and more importantly than just winning a pro tour, 
This was a block constructed Pro Tour that it won. It won the Zendikar block constructed Pro Tour, and it won it in the hands of P- uh, uh, Paulo Vitor Damo de Rosa, giving him his first Pro Tour title. Mm-hmm. And so, to my mind, that is a huge selling point. It's also why I wanted to make sure I talked about Sphinx of Lost Truths and a bunch of these other cards that were on my list. But really, the one of the cards in the deck that stood the test of time the most is Oracle of Moldiah. My number three. Um, um, or my ten. Cool. There you go. We we have all of it on our list. Oracle of Moldiah is a three generic and a green elf shaman 2-2. Two, two. It says you may play an additional land on each of your turns. You play with the top card of your library revealed, and you may play land cards from the top of your library. I like that it lets you play the additional land, meaning you can cast it on curve. A lot of these uh, creatures that allow you to play lands off the top, you have to kind of wait a turn to make sure you can get the value out of it. This is seeing play in Commander. This is still seeing play in some competitive formats. This is all over the place. It's a very impactful card. Yeah, it's just, it's it's one of those cards that, you know, like was clearly, you know, good, but a four mana two two isn't always, you know, lighting the world on fire, but then came Balakut and then came Primeval Titan and Friends. And of course in Block Constructed, it was also awesome. And we finally, finally got a reprint apart from Jumpstart uh, in Double Masters 2022, including extended art versions that have foils and stuff, which are super nice. Um, and they get even an etched foil version, which is also super duper cool. Um, so yeah, you can get your Oracle Moldiah in plenty of flavors these days in ways that it was much more difficult and much more expensive in the past. So we're going to move on here to my number one. And I think through elimination, this is Nerd Girls number five. Um, but I could be wrong. I might've missed it. But for my number one, uh, this is, it's a little on the nose. Okay. It's a little on the nose. I'm cheating. Yeah, I mean. You know where I'm going. How can you, how can you have Zendikar? How can we look back? How can we talk about its importance to the game of magic and not talk about the fetch lands? That's yeah. my number one. No, I yeah. mean, that makes sense. Like, that, It's my this, number five. It's okay. very impactful, not just in, um, you know, every format, but also with the financial side of magic. Like these oh, yeah. Zendikar lands are part of what makes or breaks whether you can get into a format like modern. Um, you know, mo- uh, margin trading and things like this paid my rent. And I would say 80% of my like margin trading stuff just came from like swapping around these lands. So impactful all around. And I agree with Evan. You can't really have the set or talk about the set without talking about these lands. Now, no, yeah. these are the enemy color fetch lands, the red, blue, the green, blue, you know, the white, black, stuff like that. Scalding Tarn and Friends. But, you know, the fact that we hadn't had them, we got them in Onslaught, the original ally colors. And, you know, no idea when the enemy colors were coming out. This is the land set. They're making it about lands. Land falls a thing. Here comes fetch lands. Fetch lands in standard. Fetch lands for 20 bucks for for a very long time until it finally went away. And then suddenly the fetch lands went to like 60 some dollars. And that was a whole thing. But uh, yeah, I just cannot think of Zendikar and not go like fetch lands are just the number one thing you can take away from the set, no matter what else you look at. A hundred percent agree. I mean, me not having them on my list is the mistake, but I, I knew that you would pick up my slack and I knew that we would talk about them. Um, they're the five most common cards in commander from this set They've all won Pro Tours. Um, they've all been an indelible part of every format, not the least of which is they are specifically referenced in not being playable in Pioneer because mm-hmm. the rest of every other format's mana base is so dependent on the Fetchland Shockland or Fetchland Dewland mana base. Um, they're ubiquitous, and they're they're what you put into a set in order to make sure that that set sells as a success, uh, as is evidenced by having, you know putting dual lands and fetch lands and shock lands in things like infinity and magic 25 and or or um the the master sets and things like that so um there's no fault here in calling out uh the enemy color fetch lands that debuted in zendikar yeah, I mean, you know, you helped out with some of my, you know, uh, my picks too as well for Step Links, for example. I'm glad it was on your list. Um, you know, I appreciate that Blood Gas was on Nerd Girls, for example. Yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, Zendikar was just a, a hell of a magic set. 
And that was our retro top 10 Zendikar cards. You'll see them on the screen right now if you review. Take a look at my list, Nerd Girl's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win 50 bucks worth of anything at CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Nerd Girl. Thanks for having me, guys. See you next week. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks. See ya. And we'll see you on our final slide right here. Bingo, bango. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsors, CardHoarder.com and Ultrasleeves.com, my co-host, MTG Nerd Girl and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching and listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Choice.tv and Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.